Hey, um, I've, it's been uh, come to my attention that we have some type of issue with the homework this week, which, um, my apologies, probably my fault. Um, so if you have some red where you think you shouldn't, hang in there. I'm going to double check everything tonight uh, on my side, and you're probably right. Um, there's usually coding this on my side is sort of a nightmare. So I'm going to um, I'm going to try to remedy it. Um, my goal is to make it so that you know the web page will see it and grade it correctly. Um, that might take some time to get fixed, but I will send you an email when that happens, and you will see it. So um, my apologies. Uh, yes, Adrian. Yeah, was that an issue with the significance versus minor? That might yes, I believe it is. Uh, significance that was one thing, and there might also be with a, a direction. As well, like the pot, more the more better, less better, the pot, more negative, less negative. So um, I will get that feedback settled on this one, and I'm hoping that as we go along in the homework system, I'll get better at coding it. I redid the homework system in R this year to try to make it easier, so this wouldn't happen. And I'm still working through the bugs of that too. So my apologies. Um, once I give you that information that it's been fixed or whatever. And if you are able to go look at it again, which is my goal, um, and still there's something that you don't see right, let me know. Um, I'd like to confirm it, but we'll double check. And then um, with that, um, certainly if, 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 if I can discover that it's, you know, it's on, on certain things that aren't my fault and you'd like more explanation, I'm happy to give that to you as well. So, okay? So I admit fault. I am a, I'm a flawed human being, I apologize. Uh, but at the same time, I hope that you're getting something out of this class. Okay, okay. So hang in there. And you, and you can tell I'm not really worried about, I'm not trying to grade you punitively. I don't have this, like, har I don't want to be this harsh person grading. There's sort of the carrot and the stick, like, you know, motivating you to get to understand it. I can tell you're working on this, so I'd like to reward that, and so. At least I gave you some ex more extra credit today, right? Is that? Yeah. <laughs> always uh, the next thing is to bring in like candy or pizza or something like that, right? So it's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, I forgot. You know, with all this festivities this week, tomorrow's Valentine's Day. We are a, uh, I know, we are a Valentine's free household, Valentine's Day free household. So there is no celebrating that for me. I don't, I don't observe. So. Sorry, did I, should I mention that? My bad. Anybody do anything fun for Lunar New Year this, this, this weekend? Anybody? No? No? All right. Let's get back to it. How are we doing with maximum likelihood so far? What was the question? How's maximum likelihood sitting with you? Now, again, you, remember, you're not going to have to build this yourself. I just want you to understand the, the role of distributions in it. So the, the cool thing is you can swap them. If it's got a distribution, you can do maximum likelihood. That's where I'm going with this. Cool? Cool. So let's, let's dive a little bit deeper into it. Um, <clears throat> we're going to start with a one observation likelihood function. This is a terrible idea in practice because think of it this way. You collected one piece of data, and you want to know the mean and variance of it. Isn't that your data? Yeah, exactly. But that's why I'm doing this, because you know what it should tell you? First of all, it, it, we couldn't find the variance, so we're just going to pretend we know the variance. Hey, 5.29, that's good. Why do we know that? Because it's written somewhere. Or better yet, my favorite, because so-and-so found in 1954, or, you know, <laughs> And you have that EG, you know, in, in the citation where they've got 15 citations. So it's 5.29. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. All right. Uh, so there is 5.29. The reason why we have to do that is actually is because we don't have enough data to find the variance. We need two pieces of data at the very least to find the variance. And even then, it's not really a variance, right? So, but yes, we have 112 as our observation. So we know mu. I'm sorry, we don't know mu. Pardon me. X is 112. Put that there for X. We'll put 5.29 here for the variance, right there and right there. So now we can plug in a bunch of different values of mu and get the heights for mu, right? 
It's literally, that's all that is, right? So we could do that. Uh, this is, this one value, the height of it gives us this likelihood function. It sort of used, often gets denoted with an L to represent its likelihood. Um, and But it's the likelihood of mu now, given that the data was 112 and the variance is 5.29. So, with that, as Maggie mentioned, what is the mean of our one observation? What do you think? One, that should be 112, right? It should be the data. And sure enough, 112 is the value that maximizes that likelihood. Right? We could, we could just guess a bunch of values for the mean if we didn't know better. So see that, yeah, Ryan. So 21 times no, 0.173 is only relative to this variance. So you think what happens if the variance weren't 5.29, what's going to happen to the shape of this distribution? All right, if it's smaller than 5.29, it's going to get more peaked, and 0.173 is going to go up. And if it's larger than 5.29, it's going to get flatter, and it's going to go down. And realistically, when we don't know variance, when we have to find both mean and variance, we're searching at the same time, because we're trying out different variances and different means, that number is going to be all over the place. So no, it's, it's not guaranteed. It just happens to be that this is the number that showed up before. But this process with one observation, again, it's sort of ridiculous. It's like, why are we doing this? Because if we could do it with one, we can do it with the whole sample, right? Right? Every one, we could do this for every one of our pieces of data. We could plug in each of these values of the mean down here. And every one of our pieces of data are going to give us a height. Right? We have five observations. All five would give us a height. They all won't be one, uh, 1 1.73 or 0.173. They'll all be a different value for each mean. So what we have to do is aggregate them together to build this joint likelihood. So that's what comes next. To get from the observation to the sample, we have to build the likelihood function across all of our people. How do we do that? Meredith. Oh, no, no, it's good. Different question. Pause here. Flip back. Go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ah, it maximizes this function right here. So what we're talking about is we want to find the mu that gives us the largest number that comes out of this function. So it's maximizing the likelihood function. It's really maximizing essentially a distribution. It's saying, um, I mean, in general, the process of finding a maximum, you just have a, you have some type of curve, right? You find a, well, this curve represents a distribution of the data for us. But because we've plugged in the data already, now we're flipped it on its head. It's sort of like a distribution for mu. What's the most likely value of mu that occurred from this distribution? Or, or better yet, what's the most likely value of mu given these are my data? Right? That, that's right. That's right. That's exactly it. The height itself is now saying, oh, that's the mu that it's the month that's the maximum. That's the, the most likely mu that gave us these data. So for 112, the most likely mu, well, we already see that, right? And the only mean we can have is 112, right? Sum of x over n, 112 over 1 is 112, right? So that is the mean, and sure enough, that's what it's telling us. It's like, oh, I tried out. Literally, I plugged in into these other values from you, had it give us the height, and, but it, the maximum actually was at 112, right? Does that help? But that same process is going to hold next when we go from one piece of data to five. So what we're going to see is the joint likelihood for the sample from some taking the product of the heights for all of our pieces of data. Okay. So we have, before we saw, in for the, the case where the observation was 112, we saw the height was 0.173. Well, if we have another observation, maybe it was 110, it would give us a different height for a mean of 112. Right? So each of them is giving us a different height, and we're going to take each of those heights and multiply them together. That's right, yeah. That's right, that's right. What, what's where it's coming from all this, that's right. So here's the cool thing though. Why do you think these are multiplied together? 
Right. That's where it's going. Yeah. That's it. That's the example I would give. If I have a coin, what are the chances I flip a heads? 50 50. What are the chances I, hit, I flip a heads once and then I flip a heads again? 0.25, which is 0.5 times 0.5. And why is it 0.25? Why are they multiplied together? Because you have to get one and then it's the other one. Yeah, but it's also more than that. They're independent observations. Independent observations. Independent observations. This was when we sort of got, I barely mentioned this in the distributions lecture, but a joint distribution of data made up of independent observation comes from the product of each of the likelihoods. So in this sample, we're making one big assumption right now, and that's that all of our observations are independent, right? So we're multiplying the likelihood. Yes, yeah. But let's say, so if you're, if you're, let's say if you're getting two and four and five, mm -hmm. are those observations really independent? If it's the same student? If, you're, if it's the same student providing that one stream of data, most likely not. And therein lies the problem in a lot of our statistics, right? We have these assumptions that build our models, that build our estimators, and we have to mirror that with our statistics that we do. For instance, let's imagine you're following not just one student, but maybe it's not a single case assignment, maybe you have um, some type of intervention and you're doing progress monitoring throughout the year, right? So maybe you're, you're providing quizzes on a topic, like the same general topic, or better yet, um, you're looking to Trying to think of something. You're looking to um, study self-determination in students, right? Like, and, and so you've got measures of self-determination throughout the year, and maybe you have an intervention for some group or not. But maybe you have five or six observations of the same self-determination measure from each student. All those are going to be correlated. But now, think about what you're doing. If you try to model those observations, that's a multivariate. You're not modeling one outcome, you're modeling five. And so that's why we have the multivariate statistics that we have, because now the multivariate statistics have to incorporate some type of correlation between there to get the dependency right. So beyond that, think of it this way. If these were five observations from the same classroom, right? If, they were, if, we, if we go look at our, uh, like in education, our data are often clustered. Students within classes, or students within schools, or students within some type of program. People from the same program tend to have more dependency to them than what our model would suggest. And so, yeah, we have to worry about that. So, yes. But in our simple example here, we're making this broad assumption that the data are independent. And that's why we can multiply them. If they aren't, in, aren't independent, what do we need? Multivariate statistics. Setting up why the class exists, right? <laughs> There's a reason, I promise. When we taught this the first time, you remember the first Karate Kid movie way back in the 80s? And like, uh, like Lisa showed a clip of, like, if you remember the movie, I barely remember this, but like uh, the Karate Kid, uh, Ralph? Ralph Macchio. Macchio, thank you. Uh, he was learning, like he wanted to do karate, but no, he had to wax on and wax off, and he had to paint the fence, and he had to, right, all the other stuff. We're sort of doing that part right now. We're sort of getting to the part where yeah, this is why we have it. I'd rather like kind of give you the rationale and the motivation for it to, to, to understand the story, but we're going to have lots of time to do it after this. And then, of course, for the rest of your life, you are be pursuing multivariate statistics everywhere, right? So. Uh, well, no, I'm not. If I was Miyagiing us, I would be, uh, I'd have like great, perfect responses on that homework system. So, no. <laughs> I'm more like the, what's the other one? The Kublai Kai or whatever. <laughs> Cobra Kai, whatever those. I'm like them. I'm like, yeah, sweep the leg, right, you know? So, what's, what's that? <laughs> uh, I'll leave it. Um, bad analogy. So what, how we denote this product term in, in notation and statistics is this capital pi looking thing. When you see a big pi, it means product, usually. Uh, so it's the product of all of our distribution functions, which really it's the product of all of our normal distributions. And with a little... Well, a lot of algebra, it looks like that. Yeah, don't, don't worry about that. Don't memorize that. Just say, yeah, it's the height for all five. Cool? Cool. Those of you who might want to do that, just ask, try to give you the breadcrumbs to 
You can come back to statistics. It's okay. Ryan. Uh, Bless you. I might have missed this, but do you think that the sigma was whatever the number was? Yes, 5.29. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Well, right now, before, with one observation, we actually couldn't find it. If we were to build a likelihood function for it, it would not have a maximum. We could try to plug it in, but no matter what range we had, it would either be increasing or decreasing at one end of it. So that's why I didn't want to get into that. But that's really where the story of it is. Sometimes, bless you, if you don't, what, what we would find there, what we'd call that is an under-identified model. Right? We don't have enough information to, fall, to find all the, the, the parameters of the distribution. And, and because we didn't collect enough data, that would be what we call empirically under-identified. So that's why I said, let's just pretend it's been known. But now with five observations, we can find it. Right? So that's what we're gonna do. Allergic to ML, I get it. <laughs> I get it. The Bayesians are like that too. They're like, ugh, frequentists. <laughs> but then you're like, yeah, but we converge to the same place. And they're like, yeah, shut up. Anyway, so <laughs> anybody who takes a Bayesian class from someone, just tell them that and they get all mad. In the limit, yeah, well, that's what you frequent is sick. Anyway, so it's like, seriously, it's like, never mind. Um, so the sample likelihood function is that, right? At least I'm trying to make this, trying to like, like not make this too serious. Like, just, right? So basically, what's the sample likelihood doing? It's taking all of your data. You try out a version of, of the mean, you try out a version of the, of the variance, and it tells you the height. Right? Cool? Um, so the goal is to maximize this sample likelihood function. So here, again, let's just imagine we did know that the mean was 5. Point, the variance was 5.29. In a couple slides, we're going to ignore that. But let's just imagine we know that happens to be the case. Why I'm doing that here is because it's easier to, to plot in two dimensions rather than three. So we can see it. Uh, this likelihood function now, for all five cases, we try out versions of the mean. Right there. So on the x-axis, so all my I literally just cranked through a bunch of the means. You can see a loop in R where I did this. Right? It's going through all the values of mu from 100 up to 125, right? Within 0.1 increments. And sure enough, Right there at 114.4 was the mu where the peak was. And that peak was at a value of 1.67 E negative, negative 06. What the? Right? What is that? That's taking this decimal place and moving it over there six digits. Right? So that's a number that has five zeros in front of the one. Really, really tiny. Right? So that's what happens to be for likely. So, you might have noticed a lot of what we talk about with likelihoods, though, it's not likelihood function, it's the log of the likelihood function. Familiar with log? Remember, I remember like uh, back when I was young and naive, I was like, yeah, everybody was log, it's a button on a calculator. Now we don't have calculators anymore, right? But, long story short, it's a function you apply to data, right? And the log of a small number often is easier to work with. So often what we do in statistics is not work with the likelihood function, which is the direct height that comes out of the PDF, but we take the log of that thing instead. And why we do this in a normal, when, when we have a normal distribution, is because we get math functions that look a little easier. That may not look a little easier to you, but to do people doing the math on it, it's actually quite a bit easier to deal with the function right here because we're not dealing with exponents, where before, this thing right here, this EXP, was like taking the letter E raised to this power, and E is, what's that, Euler's constant, is that it? 2.71, remember that? It's the inverse of the natural log. So if you, uh, this is E to the one, or equivalently, if you said LN of E, you get one, right? That's what's happening. So it's a lot easier to do things without exponents when we do calculus, practically speaking. Uh, so that's why this looks nicer here. But when we do that from a pragmatic sense, it does not change where the maximum is. It changes the value of the maximum. We've taken the log of what the maximum is. But it doesn't change that the, and the maximum still is at 114.4, right there. 
right? So it's right there, 114.4 is the maximum, is the point would maximize it. But now instead of being this 1.67 e negative 6, it's the log of that number, which actually is negative 13.3, which is a lot of, it just rolls off the tongue a lot easier, right? So, with me? So, what have we done? We have data. We assumed a distribution. We built a likelihood function, or a log likelihood function, the log of that function. And we tried out versions of the thing we were interested, the parameter. And we found the value that gave us the peak. That's MLE. That's the process of maximum likelihood for you. Hooray! Right? And that same process happens whether your function log likelihood looks like this, where you started with a normal distribution, or you started with some distribution you've never heard of before, like this one. This is the Cauchy distribution. I don't really know what it does. Oh, sorry. I don't do this stuff. I don't. Cauchy is not something I usually uh, think about, except for in these crazy examples. But that's a distribution. We know it, it has an area under a curve of one. It's got some type of parameters. And oh yeah, there's the PDF. I plug in data, I plug in parameters, it gives me a height. I can take a height and build a likelihood function out of it, right? So literally, it's a recipe book for how you build a distribution that's more appropriate for your data is where I'm getting to. Pretty cool? Cool. All right. Moving on. Over here. But what about that variance, Ryan? <laughs> no, not, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> I mean, picking on Ryan. I feel like we have this rapport now. I can just pick on you. So. Anybody else want to be picked on? I can. Oh, Kevin? Okay. Does anyone want to volunteer to be a scapegoat? It's, it's your fault that my homework. Oh, Michael, your, my, your fault my homework system broke. There, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. There we go. Scapegoat, picked on. All right. <laughs> left alone. The rest of you left alone. If anybody else wants to volunteer for random roles in class, that's fine too. <laughs> Sorry, I have to break this. this is, if this is dry for you, you know he's going to be killing me, right? So I'm trying to make this, I think there, but, but the reality of this is I feel like it's critically important. Like just having this little bit of understanding of what's going on broadens what you can do with the rest of the world or what you even can ask to do with the rest of the world in statistics. So that's why I want to do this. I'm just trying to do it in a way that's mildly amusing rather than just, you know, straight math, which is what I, I feel like I do when I talk to my computer to do these online lectures. Anyway, um, what about variance? Well, it turns out we could build this likelihood function with variance too, right? Instead of just trying out a mu, we could actually try out a sigma squared as well. It's two, we have two things we have to figure out now. Right? So how do we do that? There's a plot. Well, over here, this is the, the likelihood surface. That's what it's called. It's two dimensions. We have mu on one side. We have the variance on the other. These are values of each of those. And so for any pair of values, like over here on this plane that's on the bottom, it gives us a height that's represented by that curve above it, but the height, because we're, we have two parameters to try out, we have these two dimensions to look at, we have to plot this in three dimensions, right? So you can't see this very easily if we get to a third parameter, forget that, right? But the concept still applies. And sure enough, this surface, with the mean, you can see a nice curvature to the surface, right? You can kind of figure out where the nice, there's a nice peak to the mean. The variance looks really flat. And that's because with five observations, so not a lot of data to go figure out that variance. I know if you ever talked about sampling distributions, remember the sampling distribution of the mean? If you keep doing repeated samples, the mean of all those samples becomes normal at some point. Well, the variance of sampling distribution is much slower to converge to normal. It is really, really slow. So what that means is you need a lot of observations to get a good estimate of where the variance happens to be. Another part of that is, has anyone ever seen a standard error for the variance before? That's a little weird, right? In LM, for the linear model, it tells you residual standard error or standard deviation. But it didn't give you a standard error around that. It's been like a 
uncertainty to it, if you were to build a confidence interval for the variance, that confidence interval that we'd get from this plot would be very wide because it's just not a lot of information there. The curve of the likelihood function actually tells us how certain we are in our answer, which is kind of cool. So this is, the this is the likelihood with the surface. We'll find that the values that maximize this is 114.4 for the mean and the variance is 4.24. And the log of this function, or the likelihood, where that peak is, is negative 10.7. And so this other plot that you see over here is a contour plot. You may have seen contour plots before. You seen a contour map before? Right, where you... Uh, you can essentially, this is us here at Joseph R. Pearson Hall, but you see these little lines through there that sort of equal elevation that talks about how high up you happen to be. And if you are really into like mountains and stuff, they start to look, they used to, well, back before we had better graphics, they used to look some, something like this. Those areas right there are sort of equal altitudes or heights. Well, our, our likelihood function in multiple dimensions is very much like a mountain. And so this plot on the right are equal likelihood, equal values of likelihood. And right here in the middle is the peak. But you see these lines look straight because I can't zoom in on them much because I'm zooming in on kind of the top part here. And because the variance is so, that likelihood is so flat for it, you don't see circles. You normally see circles with a, a, a contour map. If I were to zoom out more, you'd finally see the circle. They'd just be way out on the edges. So that's the contour plot. So finding the maximum is very much like a problem of, I know this is, this is sort of a weird game, but if you can imagine getting, the game is find the peak. Like if you've got a mountain here, we've got Mount Uriad. This is what we call a mountain in, in this part of Kansas, right? <laughs> right? And someone were to like blindfold you and drive you to a park somewhere on campus where the hill is, and they told you with the blindfold on, you've got to find your way to the peak. How would you do it? You're, you can't see. Would you step around and try to figure out where the highest part is? That's how the maximum likelihood function works. It's like you've parachuted in or dropped off on the side of a mountain, and you're trying to find the peak of it, but you can't look for it. You can't see it. You have to sort of feel your way up to the top. That's how these MLEs work, maximum likelihood estimates work. Right? And so there, if we, we, we just guessed everywhere around it. That's, that's one strategy. I'm just going to walk everywhere around until I finally get to some place that I call the top, right? There are more efficient strategies than that. But that's what an MLE is doing. It's taking this mountain, this likelihood function, and trying to figure out where the peak of it is. Because that's what we do with mountains, right? Look at all the people on Everest. No, I don't know. Not me. <laughs> so one quick question here. You might have noticed that our variance estimate was 4.24, whereas pre previously I said it was 5.29. Is that odd to you? Yeah, here comes another one of the confounding issues with maximum likelihood, in that the MLE the variance estimate, we're going to see this in a few slides, remember the variance was the sum of x minus its mean squared over usually n minus 1 for the MLE over n. Uh-oh. The MLE provides a biased estimate of variance for finite samples. And so while our difference, so if we divide it by n minus 1, our variance was 5.29. We divide by n, it's 4.24. And now you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, didn't you say something about consistency? of the estimator, we get the right answer eventually? Well, when n goes to infinity, if n is infinity, subtracting one off of n at infinity isn't going to matter much. It's going to give you the same number, right? And so that's what's happening with all this. It's eventually going to give you the right answer, but for, for any given n, it might be biased, and bias is by some amount. Yeah, Alan. Um, I have a question. How do you interpret Ah, by itself you don't. So when we see that number, 
just negative 10.7. That's the maximum. Relative to some other model, now we start to compare it. We can start building a statistic out of it. But by itself, we generally just say, oh yeah, that's the maximum. There it is. Good question. Other, other thoughts? They're all good questions, by the way. If I don't tell you a good question afterwards, I apologize, but they are all good questions. I want to encourage your questions. Yes, Jihan. Yes. I'm wondering if you want to transition to a several system. Ah, so it is possible you may have a likelihood function that has more than one peak. There are, um, and when it comes to distributions for that, um, there is a, a, a very big, what we call family of distributions, so you know, another statistics term, something called the exponential family. <laughs> that's a pretty screwed up family, right? <laughs> exponential family, yeah, that's right. But if you have a, if you're trying to find an MLE in the exponential family, there's one peak. We've, we've, there's results that show there's one peak. What is the exponential family? Well, it turns out the normal distribution is part of that, and pretty much most of the distributions we're going to, all the distributions we're working with in class this year, with the exception of the class I bumped out when I screw things up, when we get to clustering or classification, because the distributions there are mixture distributions. Mixture distributions are outside of the exponential family, so they're not guaranteed to have a single peak. But the irony is, most, for most practical statistics, the things that we deal with from now, uh, the things that you were in with your previous classes, the thing you saw in basic statistics, all the way through most of the, the, the classes, uh, at least in our doctoral program, all the models are exponential family. Uh, factor analysis, confirmatory factor analysis, item response theory with the exception of when you have a C parameter. Um, complicated model, but most of, most of the, the vast majority. So generally speaking, we don't have that problem. If we did have that problem, we can still find ways of finding the peaks, but let's get to that. I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment. So if I forget, when we get to like derivatives, remind me, okay? Yeah, there's derivatives coming. You don't have to remember, it's conceptual. Yes, Sam. The maximum. So I'm thinking about when, when there's, I forget what it's called, bi bimodal distribution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would that be? Consistent? That's exactly right. Yeah. If we had our likelihood function, it looked like this, right? This is our, our likelihood function. But there are likelihood functions that might look like this as well, right? And there may be another one where the peak is identical. But most of the things we're going to encounter only have one peak. Does that help? Good. Good question. Other, other thoughts? Okay. So, how do we find the maximum apart from guessing? What's that? That's right. Differentiation. In mathematics, uh, we can use calculus to help us find the maximum. Again, you don't need to do calculus. All right, just put that over there. For those of you who don't like calculus, put that over there and that put it in that door right there. That's the calculus door. We're not going to open it. It's it's locked, right? I can't even get in, right? That's that's the calculus room over there. You don't have to do that, right? I'm doing this because in my experience in teaching this class, if I say the word calculus, if you were like me when I heard calculus back when I was like math phobic, I'd be like, <gasps> right? No. But let's talk about the concept of it, right? There are ways that we can figure out where the maximum happens to be. And calculus helps do this um, by effectively this. If we think of, have you heard of what's a tangent line? Ever heard of that before? A tangent line is a straight line that just essentially touches the curve at one really, really tiny point. We know when a tangent line has a flat slope, a slope of zero, we're at either a maximum or a minimum. Right? Well, in calculus, the process to go find the line, the, the slope of that line, is something called differentiation. Take the derivative of the log likelihood function. The derivative, me and my Wikipedia slide, here, here's the derivative. This is doing calculus. There it is. Look, it's going to be flat. Oh, there it goes green. It's going downhill. No, it didn't change. That's blue down there, I guess. And black flat up, green going up. 
All right. So this is like the like what happens. These are the tangent lines at every point. Each one of them has a slope, but when that slope gets to a, a, a peak or a valley, the slope is flat. And because of that, we know we're at some type of maximum or minimum. And that's literally what the computer is going to do for us. It's going to be doing calculus to figure out the slope of this thing. Now, in some cases, and in this case I've shown you right here with normal distribution, we can do calculus. Well, they, they can do calculus. Sorry, I, I like actually come to love calculus. But believe me, it took me three hard years of college. I, I should bring in my Fs in math. All right? I have a badge. Like if I can learn it, you can. That's where I'm going with this, right? It took me a long time to get to calculus in college, okay? But the calculus room's over there. If we did calculus, we'd differentiate the log likelihood with respect to one of the parameters we're looking for. Technically, this is a partial derivative because there's two parameters we're after. We know what x is. We don't know sigma squared, but if we go and do this differentiation and we solve for x, what we find is the ML estimate of mu happens to be the sum of x over n. Ta-da! Isn't that cool? You've been using the mean to summarize distributions. Sure enough, that's an MLE for a normal distribution. Is that cool? We can do the same process with the variance. We do all this calculus, blah, 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 blah. They do this calculus. And they show us that the variance is 1 over n times the sum of x minus mu squared. Ta-da. Yeah, Sarah. Why is that the hat over it? I don't know why I put it there. I probably just, I should have just left it as sigma squared. Okay. It's our estimator of the variance. I think that's where I was going with it. Like it's not, it's, but it's still the parameter. It's the thing that would maximize. So, so basically all that search that I did through my function, I didn't have to do because I have the answer right here. There's a formula. When we start teaching you statistics with the formula, hey, there's a formula, there's the answer, right? Well, it turns out, especially in this week in, 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 uh, in our homework that's about to come out, which is logistic regression, you have one binary outcome. There is no formula that gives you the right answer. It has to go through a search process, a guess and check process to figure out what the right answer happens to be. Um, so we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about also was we could also, bless you, take a look at, there's another term in calculus we could talk about that sort of quantifies what I was talking about with our curve here. You can see how curved our, our surface happens to be, our, our mountain happens to be. Like with respect to the mean, it's very curved. With respect to the variance, it's very flat. And there's, a, there's another term from calculus, or another process from calculus by which we can use to quantify that curvature, like how, how curved it happens to be. And that would be the second derivative. If we diver differentiate our result a second time, this case partial derivative with respect to x, we'll find that the result from our calculus that they did was negative n over sigma squared x. Turns out the variance of mu, what is the variance of the mean? What is the sampling distribution of the mean? Do you remember that? We had the standard error of the mean, sometimes as standard deviation over the square root of n. Remember that formula? If we square that thing, we get standard deviation, variance over n, and sure enough, that comes from calculus as well. It tells us the standard error of our parameter is also embedded in our likelihood function. So sure enough, we, we pick the distribution, we build a likelihood function, and either we use calculus if we have a closed, what we call a closed form. If we have, a, if we have, have an equation we can use, we can just use that equation. Most often, we don't have an equation we can use, but we can use numeric versions of calculus. The computer's doing this for us. It's called optimizing our function uh, to figure out these terms as we go through. Isn't that cool? Like, you never thought that. I don't know. For me, that's cool. Like I just said my data were normal. And sure enough, I do this maximum likelihood dig deal. I put them all together, and somebody can tell me the derivatives. And sure enough, I get 
my result, I get good properties, I get the standard errors, I get everything that I need to know from the data. It's all coming from that. Mary Beth. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, in the original example, the 112, I'll get back to it. Oops, not there. It's here. It was for one piece of data, one, one, one observation. So with that one observation of 112, the mean of 112 was the most likely. It was sum of x over n. Oh yeah, absolutely. So here, and so the key to all this is, is our data. Right, I picked the first observation. I said 112. Let's just imagine building this with one just to show you the process. Plugging in mean, get height. And it's possible this, it's possible the mean was 114.4. It's just this observation, we couldn't see it. So if all of our data was 112, we'd just say that that's our best guess for what the mean is. But when we put all of our data together, we saw that the, the actual mean that gave us the maximum was 114.4. And so it was because we built a likelihood function that had all five pieces of data rather than one, we got a different answer. It's like our n grew. Does that help a little bit? You can think of it this way. Like if you do your dissertation and you collect a small sample first and your advisor says, you need more people, right? And you'd already analyzed your data and you get more people, the numbers are likely going to change. Well, in, in the the case of the likelihood function, the numbers changed and shifted where the peak was because the... So, okay, so that I understand. So I thought, I guess maybe I misunderstood. I thought that the 114.4 wasn't a likelihood for it. In, in 114.4, in the original example, did have a chance. It was possible, right? It would be rel relative to 112. It's less likely than 112, but it's still, you know, fairly likely that it... It would have occurred, right? It's not. It's not in the tail like 125 would be or something like that. Uh, it's just that you know, it's not the value to find the maximum. And and actually, this is part of kind of underscoring. Really, you're, what you're what you're underscoring here is the process of that. What I said, the asymptotics n going to infinity, right? We went from one to five, and we should be honing in on a better mean. I don't. I don't remember what the mean of the you know. Actually, I don't have the. I didn't generate the data for. Re, you know, these are. From this textbook, but if, if I, you could do a simulation study where you have it, you know what the mean is, and do the same process, and you should see that the samples of five should be more accurate than the samples of one. Okay. That's my okay. Judy. Oh, sorry, Nahid. Wait. Nahid first. I'll get you, Judy. Just a second. Mm -hmm. Plug in the mean. That's right. What we're plugging in, in this process that I'm describing to you here, where we're searching for what the maximum happens to be, we try in, try out a value that we're guessing. Sort of a guess. I would, it's kind of like a predicted mean, but we're guessing what that happens to be. That's right, yeah. It's sort of our guess is we're going to try out, you know, if you had nothing, if you had like no computer or whatever else, or maybe you had a computer, but you didn't, you were just basically, the game was, hey, pick the, pick the mean, right? Here, I don't know, some weird game. I think of the craziest games, find the peak, pick the weird move, right? You, the, the number that we're trying out is just your guess for it. You start off and say 110, and it'd say, oh, you're right here. And so, oh, I don't know where to guess again. I'm going to try 100, no, 105, and it's lower. Oh, I'm going downhill. I need to go the other direction. It, it, is, it is a guess for what the sample happens to be. But it's, it's not population, it's a guess. So basically, it's a hypothetical. I don't know what the mean is. I don't know what the sample mean is. I'm just going to propose a value and see how likely that is relative to the other terms. Does that make And once we get to the MLE, that's the most likely mean that's the mean in the sample. Right? So we still, we're still call it the population. It's our sample estimates based on our sample because that sample built our likelihood function. But it's not, um, it's not it, it, the process of finding it is just proposing a new Hey, let me try this out. So I, I don't know how you, I don't think it's a predictive value. It's more like a, a guess. I'm going to guess the mean. Judy. Mm -hmm. 
That's right. Yes. And the maximum likelihood estimate is can be defined as the search for the group. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it ultimately, is the same thing. That's right. It is. And actually, that's where I was going with this. This whole process that I've done of guessing and trying, I could have circumvented in this example with understanding what would come out of the analytic version from calculus. But I didn't want to go to that first because the results are still identical. Right? I went and searched, even over here with this com more complicated, when I had the variance and the mean, I did this, what we call a grid search. I tried every possible value of variance and mean in this range, and I still found what the sample mean formula would give me, and I still found what the variance formula when I use n in the denominator would give me. But my process was completely different. I didn't go and calculate the sum of x over n, I was doing this likelihood process. And why I'm saying that is because, really quickly, in fact, homework three in our online lecture, once I put it, my messed up lecture together with the one that I corrected, that homework or that, that process for a logistic regression, we don't have a formula to tell us what the mean would happen to be um, when we're doing, we're predicting it with, um, like predicting y with x. So we have to search. Now, technically, what I just said was not true. There, there are formulae, but they're also iterative, but I'll just stop there. I'm digging myself a hole. I'm trying to give, I'm, what I want to give is a, a, I'm going into the weeds a little bit more, but I'd like to stay a little bit on a more higher level to kind of give you a concept. Does that make sense? Are we doing okay? You don't have to hold on to the calculus, just the concept of it. There are ways, so I guess if I'm going to summarize, there are ways to find maxima of functions through analytic means, like through pencil and paper and calculus that they do. And they do it, right? But there are also similar ways to come up to the same result through a little bit more brute force methods, right? And I did the most brute force method, which was I'm going to try out everything in a grid. I'm searching all these points of values that are possible to hone in on where a peak might be. It's labor intensive and brute force. There's actually somewhere in between the, cal the, the full analytic calculus and the, the full brute force, and that's where we, most methods end up going, and then we'll get there. Okay? All right. So that likelihood function tells us everything. It tells us what the most likely values are. When at the peak, we believe they have the properties that are good. Um, they also tell us the standard error of the parameters, like the standard error of the mean, which is pretty cool too. So let's talk about this a little bit more with our regression um, example. In R, they have a package named NLME. And there's another one called LME4. And LME stands for nonlinear mixed effects. LME4 stands for linear mixed effects, the fourth version. Often this one, the second one, is often lovingly referred to as, anybody? Elmer. Did you not? We used Elmer. Anyone ever heard that? Oh boy, the people who love Elmer love Elmer. It's not that there's like an Elmer following, right? I don't know. There's a person who does um, who does R. Who's, he's done a lot of good things for R. His name is Hadley Wickham. I don't know if you've heard of him before. Uh, if you look him up, he's got lots of help in R. He's written lots of R books. He's from New Zealand, but he's revered by everyone. He's reached that well. Hadley said status, right? And so, like Elmer has that status too, right? There's, there's certain these camps of people in R that love these things. Anyway, he's done a lot of good things. So I'm just Totally good. It is actually been completely positive for the field or for people using R. But we can actually do maximum likelihood estimation for our linear model if we use these packages. So this is different than, remember in, in, in your last homework, how could you forget? We used the LM function, and that did least squares to give us a result. And it was nice and convenient that least squares had the same result as maximum likelihood. Well, these other packages, LME, and uh, LME, Elmer and NLME do the same thing but with maximum likelihood and furthermore they're going to become more valuable to you as you go on because they do things like multi-level models, uh, repeated measures, some factor analysis, uh, multivariate ANOVA, 
Have you heard of that? MANOVA? That used to be what this class was all about. MANOVA, MANOVA, MANOVA. But now, that's least squares. And if you were missing some of your observations, that's really bad. So the mixed part of this model uh, comes from some of the parameters being what we call random. Right? So we call the fixed effects, the beta is the fixed effects. The opposite of fixed is random. Nuance, don't need to worry about that yet. Long story short, when you have dependencies in your data, we might model that with some type of rant component that's unique to a person. So at first, if you've got five observations for a person, a really easy way to, to, to sort of quantify how, re how related those five observations happen to be is something called a random intercept, where each person gets an intercept in addition to an overall intercept that everybody gets. And what that does is it allows you to estimate or quantify the correlation of the observations nested within the same person. So it's, it's kind of cool. But I'm out of time. Let's take a break. We have another hour. Let's take a break for about 10 minutes. And I'll get into doing this with our models, trying to bring it back to where we're at right now. And we'll go from there. Okay? Thanks, everyone.